Hello, brothers, sisters, and friends, and welcome to the You Are the Current Resident podcast. This is the official podcast of the National Association of Letter Carriers, the union that represents 280,000 active and retired city letter carriers employed by the United States Postal Service. I'm Ed Morgan, and sitting next to me, as always, is our national president, Brian Renfro. Hey, Brian, how are you? Eddie, doing great. Good to be back with you for another episode. Now, we've got an exciting topic today, but before we get into that, are the Phillies still ten and a half games back? They'll be ten and a half out the whole season. <laughs> we'll stick with that. I like it. As long as we make the playoffs, we're good. All right, so today we're going to be talking about the United States Postal Service's Delivering for America plan. That's a great name. wonder where they stole that from. And SNDCs. I sat down earlier this week and came up with some questions that our members might have had. If I didn't ask your question, you can always reach out through our Ask the Mailbag segment. Submit your questions to us by email at social at NALC.org. So can you talk us through the overall USPS's Delivering for America plan? Yeah, and you're right. They got the name right. Um, That's a phrase that we've used uh, for for several years now and actually had a campaign back in 2020 um, when there was a lot of COVID relief legislation on the table um, that that we call Delivering for America. But anyway, back to the plan. Let me start with a little bit of history and uh, where this plan comes from, and then we'll get into, won't get into every detail of it, but we'll we'll get into the details that are relevant, um, you know, to what we do every day and the the things that we're seeing around the country. So uh, back in 2020, when um, the current Postmaster General, Louis DeJoy, took office, um, he began working with uh, the the Board of Governors, and at that time, the chair of the Board of Governors was a, a governor, a good friend of ours, um, a guy by the name of Ron Bloom. Um, his term is, has since ended, so he's, he's no longer a governor. But they worked together to develop a plan that would play out over the next 10 years or so, and the purpose of that plan was to put the Postal Service on a sustainable financial path, um, to protect service and, and even expand, in a lot of cases, the service that we provide to our customers. So, you know, we are not uh, in a place where, you know, I, I'm going to say that we have agreed with 100% of every bit of that plan, but um, it was refreshing in a general sense compared to what we had seen really for the last decade plus, where, you know, that was leadership at the Postal Service that really wanted to try to cut their way into sustainability by reducing service and um, further slowing down the mail and, and all sorts of things that just never made any sense. So um, the plan was uh, a work in progress for a while, but then was released. They call it the Delivering for America plan. And there are pieces of the plan that have already happened. Um, one piece, maybe most notably, is a legislative piece where um, we working with the Postal Service as well as the other stakeholders, you know, were able to work with members of Congress and, and the White House to pass really monumental legislation that reformed the Postal Service called the Postal um, Reform Act of 2021. That bill was signed into law in 2022, and it did three main things. Number one, it repealed a uh, mandate that had been in place since 2006 for the Postal Service to prefund future retiree health benefits. That was costing them anywhere from 5 to $6 billion a year, and it's an obligation that no other company in America, public or private, had. Um, it also, at a, a higher rate, integrated Medicare with uh, retiree health care for postal retirees. If you go back and a few episodes ago, we uh, talked about that Medicare integration in detail, so you can listen to that if you're curious about that. It also made six-day delivery a permanent part of the law, and um, those key components of that legislation are part of this plan. So that was a a really good way to start it. Uh, As far as what I think we'll really dive into today are what the, the portions of the plan that we are seeing, and that has to do with realigning and and modifying and modernizing, hopefully, uh, the Postal Service's processing and delivery network. And I'll start kind of in a a general sense, um, and then, as Eddie, I'm sure as we go forward, we'll get into more details. But um, basically, there's a recognition that our model of processing and delivering mail was created 
in a time where the vast, vast majority of the mail that we handled and delivered were letters and flats. And over time, that the mix of mail has changed. I mean, all letter carriers know we deliver way more parcels than we used to. Um, we handle fewer letters and flats, um, particularly in the office for us on on uh, um, on office time. You know, we don't case that much mail anymore compared to years past. So you have a network that was built to handle letters and flats um, when we're now handling far, far more parcels. So um, from a processing perspective, it is modernizing to meet the demands of the uh, mail mix that we see now, and then as we'll get into in depth here in a few minutes on the delivery side, um, trying to ensure that that we can be in a place where, from a delivery perspective, we're able to get mail to carriers early um, and be able to provide you know the, the service that we um, need to provide out there with with the, the modern mix of mail. So um, that's the piece that I think we'll focus on. There were other pieces of the plan that have already happened, um, one of which I'll point out that's notable that we did not support, and that was a modification to service standards in certain geographic areas. So uh, in the past, we had a two- to three-day standard on first-class mail going coast-to-coast. Coast. That was modified, um, I guess, almost two years ago now to be increased from three to four days as opposed to two to three. And the Postal Service's reasoning for doing that was that they simply were unable to make the two to three day standard. Um, if we go back to COVID, uh, looking in 2020 during that peak season, you know, we had a lot of difficulty with, with delays in the mail. And some of that was due to capacity on airlines. So the reason for this change was that they were able to take all first-class mail off of planes and move it to ground transportation. So even a letter going from the Northeast to Southern California now travels by ground transportation. And, and their reasoning behind it was, look, we have a two- to three-day standard we can't make because we're trying to put this mail on planes that don't have the capacity so we'll move it to the ground and, you know, as opposed to having a two to three day standard at taking a week to get there, we'll have a three to four day standard and it will actually make it in three to four days. And I have to say that um, in retrospect, while we have never and will never support slowing the mail down from the standard, uh, they have made that standard since it's been made, you know, they changed it to a three to four day standard. So. Um, the performance there has, has been much better since that change went into play. So that's one of the, the early changes that we did not support. Um, really what we'll get into today is what they're doing on the delivery side of the house, what affects us, some movement of carriers that, you know, it's not really a matter of whether we support it or not. It's more a matter of how um, we're able to enforce our collective bargaining agreement and ensure that, you know, as they – take these type actions that we make it um, the best we possibly can for the letter carriers that are impacted by it and obviously ultimately the service that that we provide to our customers. So I'm sure we'll get uh, a little more in depth on the S and DC side of the house here shortly. Were we consulted with this plan? Yeah, um, we were uh, involved from a very early stage in conversations. In fact, there's a lot of pieces of the plan that um, at at some point or another were in, let's call it draft form or even maybe conceptual that, you know, we thought were a bad idea. We uh, voiced that and, um, you know, those things ultimately did not make it into the plan. So, you know, yes, we've been very involved in this from the beginning. Um, it's something that uh, I, I, you know, give them a lot of credit for their communication with us. There were things that were and in some ways left over from um, previous leadership at the Postal Service that uh, were just bad ideas and uh, that mostly included service cuts and stuff like that, um, reducing retail locations and closing post offices and things like that, that, um, you know, I think through that communication we expressed, you know, the, the real problems with a lot of those things and uh, ultimately – you know, we're able to, to keep those things from becoming a part of the plan. And, you know, and when I say keep them from becoming a part of the plan, it's just more about communication and, you know, the understanding that, uh, that the folks over in leadership at the Postal Service gained through conversations with us that, 
um, you know, not do things in a plan that um, would end up harming if indeed the goal was what they stated, you know, to modernize and provide that service, you know, anything that uh, would negatively impact our ability to do that. Uh, we were able to talk through and, uh, and, and, you know, get a lot of that removed. So the plan itself um, in its current state is there was no surprises to us. There are things that we had communicated about all along and, and been preparing for. So, yeah, we were um, definitely involved and uh, um, I, I have to give them, you know, a, a good deal of credit compared to maybe what we've seen over at LaFont Plaza in years past, that um, there was very open lines of communication, and, and the same has continued, you know, as we see this implemented. Can you explain what an SNDC is? Yeah, so this is the piece of the plan that uh, we are seeing and dealing with more than anything else on a daily basis. So SNDC stands for Sorting and Delivery Centers. And I, I the concept... Um, just to explain in a general sense, and then we'll get into a little bit more detail. Um, if you take a, a city, the, the way the Postal Service is processing a delivery network is set up. You will have multiple mail processing facilities and then dozens, if not more, delivery units. And in each of those delivery units, you know, you would have, or excuse me, from each processing location, um, you have these truck routes. Uh, in some cases, those are um, postal employees running trucks. In a lot of cases, they're um, contractors that are, are transporting mail from processing locations to delivery units. They may stop at a number of delivery units along the way. And then also in the evening and at night, they're bringing mail back from the delivery units to the processing locations. In general, what they are doing is reducing the number of processing locations, but expanding the capacity to process. So let's say, for example, you have uh, in a particular metropolitan area, seven mail processing locations. They may reduce that to two or three locations, but actually increase the capacity to process because they're in much larger locations. On the delivery side of things, they have identified places to create these sorting and delivery centers or SNDCs. And what they do with an SNDC is move a number of different delivery units, and there's certain criteria that they, they get into, and um, um, I'm, I'm sure we'll get into that a little more in a minute. But they move certain delivery units into these SNDCs, so you've got a whole bunch of carriers in one location. And what that does is reduce the amount of transportation of mail, be it by postal employees or contractors in a lot of cases, between the, the mail processing facilities or locations and delivery units. Now you've just got a whole bunch of mail going to one place in an SNDC. And then the transportation is essentially transferred from – whatever the transportation route was onto the carrier's route. So in most cases, once a delivery unit moves to an SNDC, a carrier is going to leave there and have to travel some distance to get out to begin their first delivery. Um, by reducing that transportation and moving it onto carrier routes, uh, combined with increasing the capacity to process mail, uh, the the vision here is to create a more stable um, network with a larger capacity that um, has fewer variables in terms of the things that affect us every day. So we all know we've been at work in the morning in the office and a truck's late or, you know, one little thing gets out of kilter and all of a sudden we're waiting on our mail and everything's behind and, and we all know how that cycle goes. And the idea here is... Um, to grow that capacity, but then also to decrease, you know, the possibility for that happening, to have more consistent processing and transportation, which, you know, ultimately hopefully results in, in more consistent delivery. So a sorting and delivery center is a location where they have moved multiple delivery units into a single location um, where mail will be transported from the processing facility and distributed to the carriers. How are they deciding where these things are going to go? Yeah, there's a lot of different factors. Um, they try to, one, for example, is they try to keep them within a 30-minute 
um, 30 minutes transportation from, you know, where the routes originally were. Um, if you look at a big map, they, they've got, you know, in, in pretty much every metropolitan area in the country, they've identified locations uh, where they can, you know, within 30 minutes, maximize the number of, of delivery units they can get into one S and DC. And there's, there's other things that um, we look at some of the services we want to expand in the future, such as same day delivery and um, some of the local connect and some of the other um, services that we really want to see grow. There's some, some market analysis that they use in terms of, you know, where potential revenue and mail volume could come from. That's all a piece of it too. But um, for the most part, it's it's kind of plotting on a map with with criteria uh, based on obviously where the the mail um, processing locations are as well. So some of it's uh, due to availability of facilities, and you know sometimes that's existing postal facilities. In some cases, they you know go lease or buy other facilities. Um, so there's a number of different factors that uh, that play into it, but there's been a lot of communication about how they make those decisions um, here over the last, really, I guess, year and a half or so now. How many are they going to do? Um, there's a little bit of an evolution that takes place here, but right now, uh, over the course of this 10-year plan, which has, I guess, a little over eight years um, left, they are looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 of these SNDCs. Um, we are not close to having 400 of them. We're just, uh, with, uh, I think a couple dozen or so out there now, but we've definitely, every few months we've got, um, several more that are scheduled to come online and, and later on today we'll get, uh, more in detail about what we do as far as NALC internally to try to prepare and gain information and anticipate issues that may come up, um, and, and address those ahead of time. Are they contractually allowed to move us like this? Yeah, there, so there is no contractual prohibition really on the Postal Service moving anybody anywhere. Um, when it comes to you know things we have to remember is, is they own these facilities and, and the Postal Service has their route and they can and have over time um, relocated you know, work locations and move routes and, and things like that. I think where the contractual piece comes in, this is very important for us, is based on the nature or the fact circumstances of a particular move, we have contractual provisions that apply. The majority of that's going to be found in um, Article 12 of our collective bargaining agreement. So um, in Article 12, um, Section 1C1, 2, and 3, uh, there's a number of different scenarios that are covered there that um, if that is a scenario that th they choose to move uh, a location that fits into one of those scenarios, there's there's lots of provisions there that do things like protect seniority and stuff like that. Um, this particular case, uh, these SNDCs are a little different, and they're similar to something we've dealt with for over a decade now called delivery unit optimization, where they are moving all the carriers from one location to another, but the post office where they move them from, what we call the losing installation, remains open. So that's not something that is clearly covered by Article 12 of our agreement. So we negotiated uh, back, signed back in January of this year, a couple of different memorandums of understanding that uh, cover that. I think those M numbers, if you want to look in our materials reference system on the website, are M1990 and M1991 that covers some specifics that, um, that the Postal Service has to follow whenever they move folks into, uh, into these locations. I read the Postal Record article about the plan. Can you explain the gaining and losing installation language? Yeah. Um, so the, the losing installation is, is where the assignments are being moved from, and the gaining installation will be that sorting and delivery center. So in M1990, which is an MOU that we negotiated and signed back in January of this year, um, there's a, a lot of different rules that are laid out there. In fact, there's 13 different items in that agreement that talks about, you know, what will happen. Um, it talks about how 
you know, seniority and bid assignments, how we deal with those. It gets into what happens to hold downs and temporary higher level assignments, you know, under Article 25, Section 4. It gets into what happens with, you know, annual leave request and what happens with uh, route adjustments. Obviously, when you move routes, you're moving them to a place. And in a lot of cases, we're adding travel time to them. So these agreements cover you know, how we deal with that in the short term and then eventually how we evaluate and adjust those routes. So um, there's a lot of different, it, it's, if you read that Postal Record article, we covered a number of these things. We'll get into it a little more in depth of, of how we deal with each specific location differently a little bit later on. But, um, you know, the, the gaining is going to be the installation that's created um, wh- where the SNDC is. Typically, that's going to be moved into an existing installation and then the losing installation will be where the routes move from. Um, and throughout that agreement in M1990, you'll see those those two terms used a lot that reference um, both installations that are involved. I love my steward. Are they going to come with me? Yeah, part of uh, movement into these SNDCs and, and part of the agreement I just talked about is that all carriers move. So, you know, all routes move. There's no uh, moving some and, and not others. So that makes this different than some movement we see pursuant to Article 12. In some cases, we see movement that's um, not necessitated by the Postal Service wanting to move people. Uh, sometimes it can be moved. It, it can be necessitated by, you know, having too many people in one location, what we call an excess of employees and in that case, it's seniority based, and there is something for stewards called super seniority. But in the case of movement with an SNDC, all the carriers go. So everybody that's there with you and all those routes will will move to the SNDC if you're involved. What happens to my seniority list and my seniority? Everybody maintains their seniority um, when you are moved. That's one of the specific things that we covered in uh, in the agreement that we negotiated is you know, everybody retains their craft installation seniority and uh, and their bid assignment. So you stay on your route. Um, and for the purposes of the way you accrue seniority, this is covered, I believe, in Article 41, um, Section 2B7. It, it, you're considered to have gained all that seniority in the gaining installation. So where you are uh, in the SNDC. What happens with the overtime equability list? Is it just for the people I came over with or the whole new building? Uh, the short answer is that depends. Um, it can be the entire building. That's going to be subject to, um, you know, whether your local memorandum of understanding divides that installation by section. Um, there's, and when you move into a location, many times you'll have multiple local memorandums of understanding from each of the places that are moving in. And there's a process that's laid out in uh, that MOU M 1991 that, that talks about that. So it depends. Um, it depends on what those LMOU say and ultimately depends on what, you know, language uh, once we reconcile those LMOUs through a process that we have. And we'll get into that a little bit more um, in a little while. Do I have to work overtime in an unfamiliar zip code or route? Um question is kind of similar to the <laughs> the question about overtime equitability. The answer is maybe. Um, so these are combined into one installation, you know, once we move into an SNDC. So, you know, absent language otherwise in an LMOU, um, if you're on the overtime desired list, then you would be considered, you know, available um, for all the routes there. But again, that's subject to, you know, what the LMOU um how it divides, if it divides uh, in item 18, um, that installation by section. How is this good for my route? Well, um, what we found in the ones that we have had uh, implemented so far is, you know, most routes gain travel time. So you, you're gaining travel time from the new SNDC to your first delivery and then from your last delivery back to the SNDC. And then once we evaluate the routes and get them adjusted, For the most part, we're trading delivery time, you know, for just simple travel time. And uh, for most folks, that is a positive thing that um, we're just riding in a vehicle for a few net ranges from anywhere to it could be, you know, just a few minutes up to 20, 30 minutes or so a day, you know, in each direction. It just depends on 
the geographics of a particular location. So um, the feedback and uh, the response from most folks um, has been positive in that regard that, you know, trading off some delivery time for travel time, you know, is, is definitely a little easier and better for the carrier. What happens to my, with my branches LMOU? Yeah, so the the agreement I mentioned in the MRS, it's M1991. It includes a process um, where if you have multiple installations that are involved, um, that basically uh, the parties get together and, and, you know, try to resolve any differences in the LMOU. So if you have multiple LMOUs, uh, you know, from the losing installations that are combined, and there are differences there, um, and, the, and I think it's important to know this is separate and apart from normal Article 30 local implementation that we have after we get a new collective bargaining agreement. Um, those issues are, you know, talked about uh, by the representatives at the local level. Um, those would be obviously the the branch presidents that are involved and the installation head. Um, and then there's a resolution process for any issues that are not resolved. They go up to um, the national business agent, and uh, they also go up to the Postal Service's um, field labor relations folks. And then if they can't resolve something, it'll come here to the national level for uh, for resolution. Um, one thing to note, and I don't foresee this happening anytime soon, but anything's possible. In the event, once this process is done, in the event, at some point in the future, these locations in an S and DC are returned to their original location. Then the original LMOU, you know, is, is basically reinstated as, as if it wasn't, you know, it, it had never been changed. So, um, that's the process. Uh, and it's just to resolve any differences that, that may conflict. If we're not in an S and DC yet, are we going to have to change some language when our LMOU opens up? No, there'd be no requirement for that. Um, you, if you are not uh, uh, currently, you know, have, if you have not been moved to an S and D C, then th- there's nothing that that would require you to uh, to open your your LMOU. I mean, obviously through the normal Article Thirty, you know, local implementation process, you could do that, and I'm sure, you know, at whatever point local implementation happens, which will be here in the next few months, at some point. Um, those locations that we know were scheduled to move into an SNDC, we'll, we'll definitely keep that in mind. And uh, we'll get into a little more detail in a few minutes about what our, our internal process is and the things that we look at. So I guess it's possible that, that we may, you know, during that local implementation period, if we know we have things that are inevitable, um, where we're going to move and, and we're able to resolve some things, then uh, we may do that. But, you know, there's nothing that will require you um, to make any changes un- unless you are involved in an SNDC and there are differences in the LMOUs of the routes and the, the, from the losing installations LMOUs that are moved into the SNDCs. If there are differences, yes, you have to resolve that, but um, there's, there's no requirement that anything else be changed during normal local implementation. So the last few questions, we're talking a little bit to, you know, branch leadership. So here's, let's get back to their rank and file carrier. Uh, where do my customers pick up their mail or parcel when I have to leave a notice? Yeah, so what happens uh, in the SNDCs, remember that when the carriers move, the location you move from, the losing installation, that post office stays open. So, you know, the, the, if there's a window there, it's still open. So what we do is at the end of the day, you know, whatever you would bring back, be that a piece of mail, something you left notice for, an accountable, whatever the case may be, a parcel, you bring it back to the SNDC, and then the following morning, one of the carriers, and sometimes it's the the carrier who's, you know, the post office is on their route, sometimes it may be another carrier, that stuff will be um, given to that carrier to drop off at the post office. So it doesn't change where a customer has to go get their mail. So if you have an accountable piece of mail, you leave a notice for it, that customer is going to go to the same place that they've always gone to. So um, that was one of the big pieces of this that, you know, while moving us, you know, these S and DCs, we definitely didn't want to inconvenience customers by, you know, having them 
um, you know, travel further to get their stuff. So from their perspective, you know, it'll all be at, uh, at that same location where it's always been. How does that notified mail piece get there? Yeah, the um, one of the carriers, you know, the next morning will, will take everything for that particular station or, or finance units, really what it is at that point, um, and bring it out and drop it off. So anything that was noticed was left for the day before, um, then, you know, that customer will, will be able to go there and pick it up. All right. Well, we have a special guest going to come in. And uh, Brad, do you want to introduce him? So we've been talking about SNDCs today, and uh, I'd like for us to spend a little bit of time to um, let you all know what we, NALC, here at the national level, and we'll get into also what we do at the regional level and the branch level, um, do in preparation for each of these SNDCs. And uh, here to help me uh, with that, who does a lot of work in that regard, is um, one of our letter carrier staffers. He is a uh, special assistant to the president, Doug Lape. So Doug, welcome. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate it. Uh, before we get into this stuff, why don't you just tell us briefly a little bit about yourself and where you're from and all that stuff. I know, but I think they'd be interested to know. Sure. So I'm a letter carrier out of Branch 43 in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, I've been with the Postal Service since 1996. Started as a clerk, decided I didn't want to be inside all day when it was 95 degrees or two feet of snow on the ground in Cincinnati. So in 1998, I switched over to carrying. Uh, Coming up on my 25th year, so October 10th of this year will be 25 years. I worked as a union activist in Branch 43 for a long time. I became vice president of my branch in 2011. And then in 2017, I came up here to headquarters as an assistant to the president working in city delivery. Yeah, and Doug's done a great job, and uh, he worked in city delivery for a few years, and for the last, uh, well, I guess about a year now, um, he's worked a lot with, with me and uh, um, a couple of others there on, on a number of different projects, and one of Doug's main things is dealing with the sorting and delivery center. So we uh, we get notice from the Postal Service and communication that says, you know, hey, in, in such and such month, we intend to move these places into this newly established SNDC. And from that point forward, we start a process of communication with the branch and and through the regional offices um, to really just try to gather all the information we can possibly gather. And um, once we gather all that information, we try to anticipate any issues that may be specific to that location um, and, and try to resolve those issues. But Doug, why don't we start there and you know, once we get that notification and and we know that these places are going to move to this new SNDC, why don't you just talk us through a little bit of of what you do working with uh, each of the NBA offices and reaching out to the branches in terms of gathering that information and trying to identify, you know, issues that we may have. Absolutely. So we meet with the Postal Service every other week on the SNDC initiative. We get the list of the potential sites that are going to be implemented. And we have three implementation dates per year, one in February, one in June, one in September. After we get that list, we then take these losing installations and determine if there's an impact to our craft. To do that, we look and see how many city carriers and how many routes actually exist in the SNDC and in the losing installation. Some of these offices have no impact to us. For example, our first office, the uh, Athens SNDC, there were city carriers already working in the building, and all of the city carriers that were there before implementation still worked there. No city carriers were moved in. It was all rural. So after we've determined that there is going to be an impact, meaning there are going to be city carriers moved into an SNDC, what we do is we reach out to each NBA and we start asking for information. We want to verify that what we've been told, told by the Postal Service is correct. We want to know the number of routes that exist in the losing office. We want to know the number of routes that exist in the SNDC. And we want to know the branches that represent each one, because we like to have as much communication as possible with both both the business agents' offices and the branches. So what that means is once we've gathered all of that information, determined how many offices are going to be moved into the SNDC, how many city carrier routes are going to move, we set up meetings with 
the business agents offices and the regions or the regions and the branches. So we can sit down and explain to them what's going on. There are right now three models in the SNDC. There is a model where all of the routes in an installation are moved from the losing installation into the SNDC. That is the process that's covered under M1990 and M1991, which I think you talked about earlier. The second process is where they move delivery units within an installation. For example, in Topeka, Kansas, in June of this year, they implemented an SNDC, and the only offices that were moved were delivery units within the Topeka installation. That's something which is not really covered by the national agreement. The Postal Service has the right to move their delivery units within an installation. There's no impact to seniority, bid assignments, LMOUs, because they all work in the same installation before and after the, the establishment of the SNDC. There's really nothing that needs to be done other than explaining to the carriers what's going to happen. The third situation is a little bit more unique, and that's where they take one delivery unit from an installation and move it into the jurisdiction of an SNDC. For example, back in June of this year, the Hanover Park, Illinois SNDC was established, and one delivery unit from the Elgin, Illinois installation was moved out of Elgin into Hanover Park. So once we've determined the SNDC locations, the losing installations, and whether there's an impact to the craft, we determine how those carriers are being moved. So we want to sit down and talk to the branches and explain to them, this is the process that covers this movement. Just to make sure they understand all the rules, whether it's under M1990 and 1991, whether it's under Article 12, which is the circumstance like in Hanover Park, Illinois, or whether it's just the movement of delivery units within an installation. Yeah, it's, as you might imagine, just based on everything Doug (laughs) just talked about, when you've got, you know, now we're up to, I don't know, what are we, 20-something? We're at at 12 right now, but we have more offices coming online the beginning of September. That that we know are, yeah, that, that we know are sort of in process. And then in each of those, you have anywhere from, you know, it may just be two or three installations that are that are moving in, or you may have, you know, up to an unlimited number. So, you know, there, there's quite a bit of work that um, that goes in there. So um, we try to do that, and then Doug communicates with the Postal Service uh, as far as issues that we see. Um, Doug, I want to touch on a couple of other things that we have to deal with, and, and that is sometimes we – you know, only have like a single branch involved here where places from, you know, one single branch move in. And in that case, you know, there's, there's, it's pretty straightforward as far as the representation piece. But then other times we have multiple branches and, and, you know, part of the information that, that we gather. And then, you know, when that's the case, ultimately I have to make a decision as to what the representation there. Um, will look like. And, and that's something uh, I think in, you know, early on in this process that we, you know, start to gather information. I know you have a lot of communication with the branches that are potentially involved and we try to figure out the best thing to do, you know, when it comes to representation too. Right. So as I said earlier, we sit down and talk to the branches with the regional offices. It's a little bit easier when we're talking about one branch that represents all of the carriers that are moving into the SNDC as well as the SNDC. It gets a little more complicated when we have multiple branches. Uh, The example I gave about Hanover Park, Illinois, there were two branches involved, one that represented the carriers in in the delivery unit from Elgin and one that uh, represented the carriers in Hanover Park. Uh, We've had other circumstances such as in Bryan, Texas, where there's been multiple branches Utica, New York, which has had three branches now that coexist within the SNDC. So we have to explain all of this to every branch so they understand how this is going to work. They understand the LMOU issues that they need to discuss, uh, which involves more than just one person, one branch president talking to the, to the postmaster of the SNDC. We need to make sure they understand everything that's going to happen and how their branch is going to be impacted by this change. Yeah. And, you know, it kind of goes back to the whole principle that we've used since the beginning of this is, you know, there are things that each of these have in common, but they all are also unique um, based on, 
you know, a number of different circumstances. It, it can be anything. Sometimes it's geography, <laughs> you know, where we have locations that move and you have challenges created by, uh, by the amount of travel that they have from the new S and DC or, or, you know, the, the routes that are available to them as far as traveling to and from their first delivery. Um, another piece I wanted to, to hit on that, uh, you know, definitely everyone that's moved into one of these S and DCs will be impacted by, and that is the process in M1990 for evaluating and adjusting the routes because they're, they're impacted. And, um, there's a, kind of a little interim thing that we do initially. And then ultimately um, there's a route adjustment piece that happens, you know, post actual movement into the location. So um, why don't you describe kind of what that process looks like, both initially what we do in advance and then, you know, what happens um, a few weeks after we move into those locations. Right. So one of the big things that we discussed both internally and with the Postal Service is how do we make any sort of arrangements for the fact that these carriers are going to have potentially more travel time when they move into the S and DC. And what we're talking about is when you're at your original delivery unit, you may have had a certain amount of time to get from your office to your first delivery point, And then from your last delivery point back, once that route moves to the S and DC, there could be an additional travel time. So you're going to have more time to get from the S and DC to your first delivery and more time to drive back at the end of the day. What we tried to do is come up with a way, and I think we did it in M1990, is for the national parties who are involved in the joint route adjustment process to sit down and estimate the time that it's going to take that carrier to get to their first delivery and then back once they've finished their route. Keep in mind, this is only an estimate. It is not an exact There's no way to get the exact numbers until somebody actually drives it on a regular basis. But we wanted to make it clear to both local management and the letter carrier serving the route that we all acknowledge that there's been an impact to your route. We know there's more travel time on a daily basis. So that route, which may have been eight hours before it moved, could potentially be eight and a half, 845, whatever that number is. So that was the first part of it that we did before the movement of the S and DC. So before the about 30 days before they the routes actually move, the postmaster and the branch president or their designees will sit down and explain to every carrier on their route, this is what the national parties have agreed. This is the new estimated time for your route. Yeah, and, and the idea is just simply to, you know, there's a fine line, I guess, between sort of projecting what it'll look like. But in, in this case, we're, we're not really projecting. We're, well, we're not projecting delivery time. Right. Um, we can come reasonably close to figuring out how long it takes to travel from one point to another. So um, the, the idea is, is to, that there be a recognition, of, you know, among everybody, local management, as well as the carriers of what that change is. And then we use our, our joint, route adjustment process um, once they're implemented to evaluate and uh, and adjust them. So if you're uh, in one of these new S and DCs, chances are you probably have seen Doug because <laughs> I think he's visited all of them. Uh, as we go forward, he'll continue to do that. And, you know, a number of our other staff here at headquarters as, as well as um, several of the officers and and definitely, you know, folks from your national business agent's office will, will be out there. The, the important thing for us is just to do everything we can to ensure that we have, you know, the, the right amount of communication, that we gain the information that we need to, you know, do what's best for each one of these individual sites. And ultimately, when it comes to the representation side, you know, any decision that we make here, and I'm speaking for myself here, is – you know, we're going to make the decision that's in the best interest of the members, you know, that are impacted there and, um, and their representation. So, um, Doug, is there anything else related to S and DCs that, uh, you think would be useful for the listeners to know? I think, you know, as Brian mentioned, I do get out and I traveled all these S and DCs. Uh, there's a lot of construction going on in, in these facilities because once they're done, they all look the same. They have the same color scheme. They all have new cases, which is a blue case. And 
And I'll tell you, as I said, I, I've been in the Postal Service since 1996. Uh, November of last year was the first time I'd ever seen a case that was less than 30 years old. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, they are doing some things that are nice. Uh, they are remodeling all of the bathrooms, new fixtures. They're putting in uh, new water fountains that have uh, water bottle fillers and filters. Uh, every office is getting an ice machine, not just the offices that may work in the more uh, hot and humid or, you know, those, those places that have a little bit hotter temperatures. So I, th I think, you know, we need to be cognizant of the fact that nobody likes the change. People like to stay where they're at. But at the end of the day, these facilities do look a lot nicer. Some of them are being cleaned for the first time in years, mm -hmm. which, is, which is always a positive. And I think the reason we really want to get out and see these offices is, as I mentioned at the very beginning, that we do meet with the Postal Service every two weeks. And they tell us the status of these offices. And uh, Brian, from the very beginning, has made the decision that we're going to get out there and we're going to see if what we're being told is accurate. And, and it really does open your eyes when you get into these offices instead of just looking at a single picture uh, in a PowerPoint presentation to see what the issues are, you know, so that we can address those with the Postal Service and, and get them fixed as quickly as possible. Yeah, we, uh, you know, I know this will shock everyone that's listening, but we early on in particular, we, we found a lot of places where they'd show us some beautiful picture and, you know, we'd go out there and that, you know, the bathrooms weren't working or, or whatever the case may be. And hopefully that's gotten, um, I think that's probably gotten a little bit better, but that just kind of highlights the importance of the communication. When we've um, had this communication and, you know, those issues have been raised, you know, by our, our folks locally or at the regional level, um, we, we have had, you know, very good success in terms of getting those things addressed up here. So, um, the SNDCs, as Doug mentioned, you know, any movement, we are kind of creatures of habit and, you know, we don't like change, but, um, th there are positives, you know, and he mentioned several of them that come along, along with this in terms of the amenities. And it's just a, you know, may take in a lot of cases a little bit longer to get there for some people, but, um, usually when it comes to the, the building itself, once all the construction and that stuff's completed, um, they are definitely better places to work. Well, Doug, thanks so much uh, for joining us. We appreciate all the work you're doing out there on the SNDCs. And for those of you that are involved in uh, SNDCs in the near future, there's a good chance that uh, you'll get to meet them. So thanks for joining us. All right. Thank you.